this. I'm not going to ask you to respond to the president directly. What I do want to understand is a company like yourself, how the engine gets into gear when you hear comments like that from the president. What's the reaction for a company like GSK internally? What kind of movement do you make? Well, first of all, we started uh, getting our uh, engine into gear, as you put it, Jonathan, about five years ago. So if you look at the GSK Thanks. pricing strategy over the last several years, yeah. we've been very, very uh, upfront about the need to reform pricing approach. We need to be very clear as we bring new products to market that we're demonstrating not just innovation but affordability. If you look at the la last six new medicines we've launched in America, they've been brought to market at or below the prices of the existing technologies which have been there a long time. And if you look at our overall net price levels in the U.S. over the last several years, over five years we've had a net price growth of about 1.5% CAGA. And if you look at the last two, it's actually been negative. In, in last year in particular, 2016, it was down 1% net price. So our prices are falling at the net level. Yeah. Our new products are coming in at or below the prices of older technologies. That's what we did. And, and I think what we've been very clear of, and it hasn't always been popular, we've been very clear as a manufacturer, calling for improvement in the price and environment, more transparency, and a focus not just on how we reward innovation, but also how we improve access to, to uh, patients for these medicines. Andrew, over several discussions with yourself over the last two years, it's a discussion we've had repeatedly about the efforts that GSK have put in on this front. But the president of this country supports Medicare drug price negotiations. This is something we've heard again and again from them. I just want to try and understand how that impacts GSK directly, and then we can talk about the second round effects, about how it may shape the industry as a whole. Well, it, it depends exactly what happens, and I think we're, we all know we're in the very early days of trying to understand. And one thing I think everybody realizes is the U.S. healthcare system is unbelievably complicated, and there is an opportunity to streamline it, and I suspect that would help. I think market-based solutions are the right way to go, specifically from a GSK perspective. If you look at Medicare Part B, we have almost no exposure there. So that changes in that space would have an immaterial to zero effect on GSK. In Medicare Part D, we have a bigger business presence there, but a big part of that, Jonathan, is Advair. And so whether, whether we get generics later this year or whether there's some reform in pricing in that space, uh, you can't lose it twice, if I can put it that way. <laughs> so the impact for GSK is not significant. This isn't a massive exposure for us. Uh, and actually, if you think about the guidance we've given for this year, where we have said, if indeed there is a generic, and we don't know, but if there is, we've shown people what the impact is, we can still essentially hold our earnings flat. I think that gives you a pretty strong reassurance about the robustness of the company, even in the environment of some change to Medicare Part D pricing. Well, Andrew, let's talk a little bit about risk management then. So Mylan, of course, are waiting to see if they can get their generic through against one of your best-selling respiratory drugs. That's set to happen on March 28th. As you look at things, what are the chances, what are the odds that you apply to that actually getting through? Well, we have absolutely no idea what the probability of a first, a first pass approval is. We have no idea when it would then be launched. We have no idea what volume might be available, and we have no idea what the pricing strategy is. So those are four pretty key elements yeah. in the equation we have no idea on. So what we've done is we've taken an estimate, and we've said, look, first of all, if there's no generic, we will be able to grow earnings per share this year at between 5 and 7% CER. If there is a generic, and the assumption we've laid out for our shareholders is very straightforward, if a generic arrives in the middle of the year, and if it's a pretty full-on generic, so it takes 70% market share in the first few months of launch, which would be you know, an aggressive share take, then we're saying we're going to be around flat to maybe slightly down. So what we've tried to do is give our shareholders a bracket on the upper side and a bracket on the downside, and then we'll see as we go through the year. It's in, I mean, literally, this is trying to pin a tail on the donkey with a blindfold on. It's very difficult for us to be more precise, but I think what we've helpfully done is given our shareholders a range. And actually, by the way, that lower end of the range is very consistent within a point or two of where the consensus of the street was before we announced our results today. So I think we see yeah. the world very much the same way as the street sees the world, and we're all going to learn as events play out. Well, Andrew, looking at the lay of the land so far, though, there is a carrot, there is a stick. The stick is get your prices down. The carrot is that we want to see approvals for some of these drugs get through quicker. So if that's your guidance, just for a sense of the lay of the land currently, can you assume as a CEO of a drug company that actually the approval of some of these drugs, it will be easier and it will be quicker? Well, I think, first of all, I think we'd all encourage 
safe and effective rapid regulation, and I'm using the word safe first, the number one thing any regulator needs to do is be there to protect patients. So I'm supportive of a review of regulation which helps accelerate as long as we don't sacrifice safety protection of patients. In that environment, GSK is a highly innovative company, Jonathan. Over the last seven years, nobody has had more FDA approvals than GSK. And as we look forward into the next two or three years, we're going to have somewhere between 20 and 30 new drugs come through phase two and potentially go forward. So we would be potentially a significant beneficiary of an acceleration of approval times. But critically, that has to be done while maintaining a strong focus on patient safety. Well, Andrew, you've overseen many of those approvals. And on March 31st, Emma Wormsley will take over. When you hand over the baton to her, what's the biggest challenge she's going to face? Well, I, I think Emma, no doubt, will have a full intray, as any CEO does in a company with over 100,000 people, uh, 28 billion pound revenue business. But the number one thing that she'll be wanting to focus on is as that data starts to roll in over the next few months and couple of quarters on those 20 to, 20, uh, 20 to 30 new medicines and vaccines, she's going to be the one who's making, first of all, opening the envelope, getting the good news or the bad news, and making the decision about how to allocate resources and move forward. And that's why I felt this was the right time to change leadership, because what I truly believe in is whoever opens those envelopes is the one who also launches the product. So she will be embarking on choices in the next 12, 18 months, which determines the future of our business over the next five to 10 years, during which she will be making all of those deployment choices. That's going to be the number one priority for her. I think where we stand today is we've, we've demonstrated really clear and strong momentum over the last couple of years. We've got a business now, 10 billion pounds of sales in America, 10 billion in international, seven and a half in Europe. 16 billion pharmaceuticals, seven in consumer, four and a half in vaccines. We're balanced on all the dimensions, all three businesses growing, all three businesses growing profit margin. She will be looking to see how she can accelerate and further de-risk the future growth in what, of course, is a challenging environment. And Andrew, I'm sure she knows the statistics of the company just as well as you always seem to do. Andrew, what's next for you? Well, what's next for me is another six weeks of being CEO of GSK, making sure that the first quarter of this year continues in the same theme and vein as the successful year we've just closed out in 2016. And then from April the 1st onwards, I'm going to start giving some consideration to what's next for me. And, uh, and we'll see. Um, th this has been a phenomenal experience to lead this company. It'll be a sad day to leave, but I'm very excited about Emma taking over. And I think she's going to be a terrific leader of the company.